Hello, welcome to video 15, Labour Markets. Um, Labour Markets can be, can be thought of precisely uh, in the same way as any other micro-market um, in terms of demand, supply, equilibrium. Uh, there, are, there are slight differences though. The main difference is this. Um, what's different about Labour Markets? Not much, except you've got to remember that in labour markets, unlike the markets for uh, goods and services, firms do the demanding, people do the supplying. It is firms demanding labour and people, individuals, supplying their labour for the firms. Okay, but once you've got your head around that, it, it, these markets operate precisely like any other market. So let's uh, take a look at uh, um, a labour market. So here we have the supply of labour and the demand for labour, an equilibrium price and quantity. Okay, the price of labour is the wage rate. So we've got wage rate up here. You might see W, WR, you might see P. Um, I put wage rate, W1, wage rate 1, it's the equilibrium wage rate. It's the wage rate at which demand equals supply. Um, that's the only wage rate where the amount of individuals, units of labour that wish to work at that wage rate are all employed because there is demand for precisely that many workers as well. Um, this is the supply of labour, it's upward sloping, indicating that at higher wage rates people are willing to, uh, to give, uh, give up more of their time and supply themselves as labour. And uh, the demand curve is downward sloping because firms uh, the higher the wage rate, the less labour they wish to employ. Um, perhaps there are other factors of production they can use, or perhaps they simply don't need as much labour because costs are so high, they don't sell as many products, whatever it is that, that they are making with their labour. So, and at lower wage rates, they're willing to uh, employ more uh, people, they demand more workers. And here we have quantity of employment, that's the quantity on this. You know, it's price and quantity, just like every, every other micro-market. Okay. Um, and just like any other micro market, these curves can shift. So let's now take a look at what can make a curve shift, a demand curve for labour, a supply curve of labour, and, uh, and look what, what that does to the equilibrium wage rates and quantity of employment. So, first of all, we'll look at demand. Factors that can shift the demand for labour. You know, the position of that demand curve where it is, depends upon factors such as these. And if one of these factors changes, uh, it's going to um, cause the demand curve to shift. So price and substitutability of other factors of production. So there are cases where firms can either use labor or capital, and they can substitute uh, one or the other. Now, if capital um, becomes cheaper, or if capital becomes uh, more possible to use, more substitutable uh, against labour, then we might see a fall in the demand for labour. But if the price of capital goes up and capital becomes less possible to use, then we might see the demand for labour rise and the demand for labour would shift outwards. If there are improvements in technology, it's likely that, that uh, it's going to be possible to, to produce goods without as, as many um, units of labour employed. So improvements in technology might cause demand for labour to fall. Uh, on the other hand, it might create new opportunities for labour. New industries could develop. Improvements in technology in one country might make that country the most competitive country in the world, in the global economy, and it might create jobs. Uh, so, you know, that could work either way. Demand for the good labour is making, because labour is always in derived demand. Of course, uh, when the demand for a good changes, so the demand for labour to make that good changes. So, um, as for example, there's been a, a decline over the last 20 years I don't, in, in video cassettes and video recorders. I don't think anyone uses video cassettes anymore, hardly. Um, so there's been a, demand, a fall in the demand for labour to make video cassettes and video uh, recorder technology. Um, Meanwhile, other industries have grown and uh, other, other goods have grown in demand and that's uh, created uh, demand for labour. So in um, environmentally friendly green industries, there's been a great growth in, 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 that, in that area of the economy and of course that's led to an increase in the demand for labour in, in those industries. 
So changing demand for a good will lead to changing demand for labor in that industry. And we can explore what that means. So here we have an industry, uh, there is demand supply curve, there's currently equilibrium wage rate one. If, for instance, um, capital becomes less available uh, and more expensive, and so there's more demand for labor, or if perhaps the demand for the good that is being made by this labor uh, rises, we're likely to see an increase in the demand for labor, and that's going to mean more people are employed and, and the wage rate increases to W2. So, um, you know, that, that, that would have been caused by, uh, as I said, uh, 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 an, an increase in the demand for labor because of uh, a less um, attractive capital as a substitute. Perhaps the capital got more expensive, perhaps um, the capital was for some reason less available, or there was an increase in the demand for the good which this labor was, uh, was, was making. Um, let's move on. Let's, let's look at now uh, factors that can shift the supply curve of labor. Uh, again, the position, the initial position of the supply curve is, is affected by all of these issues, uh, and if any of these change, then we'll shift the supply curve. So changes in the size of the population. If there is more people, then there is going to be more supply at every wage rate. We would see an outward shift of the supply curve, uh, showing more supply at every wage rate. Likewise, a fall in the size of the population would have the reverse effect. The supply curve would shift inwards. Changes in migration flows, because there are constantly people entering and leaving a country, and according to the net or overall migration flow, if there's a net outflow of workers, that would reduce the supply, uh, a net inflow would increase the supply of, of labour. Changes in the school leaving and retirement ages. If retirement ages are pushed back, it means there's more supply of labour at every wage rate. Many Western countries are currently uh, pushing back their retirement age because they're facing pension payment problems, the state is, and also because people are living longer and uh, there's an ageing population, and also because people in their mid-60s are much healthier and have much more to offer in terms of a work, uh, work-related way uh, than they used to. And so most countries are, are, are pushing back the retirement age, 67, 70, and this is going to increase the supply of labour. Uh, same with school leaving ages, if uh, the longer children have to stay in education, uh, the, the less supply of labour uh, there is. Changes in income tax and availability of benefit payments. The lower the income tax is, and the less available benefits are, the more supply there will be of labour. People will make the decision to make themselves available uh, as a unit of labour and supply themselves if they are attracted by a low enough tax or by the non-availability of benefits. If benefits are made more available, and if income tax rises, then fewer people will be willing to make themselves available to work. So let's show how that, uh, any of these things could affect uh, equilibrium wage rate. Let's say that the government passes a law that lowers income tax and also reduces the amount uh, of benefits available to people not working, that is likely to raise the supply curve of, of, uh, of labour. Uh, as more and more people at every wage rate say, I'm willing to work, I make myself available to work because I don't get taxed so much, or because the benefits are so poor I can't live on the benefits. And that's going to have the effect of lowering the wage rate and increasing the quantity of people working. This effect could also have been had if more people entered the country than left the country, or if um, the size of the population grew, or retirement age was pushed back. Um, and the opposite would be, of course, an inward shift of the supply curve uh, for the reverse of all of those issues. Okay, so okay, let's have a quick look at wage elasticities. You know, wage elasticity of demand, wage elasticity of supply, it's just a further application of elasticities, price elasticity, in fact, that you've already learned and understood. So we can apply this to labour markets, and this may or may not be on your syllabus. Ask your teacher or, or your lecturer, uh, but uh, you should be able to understand this pretty straightforwardly. Wage elasticity of demand, then. It's a measurement of the responsiveness of demand for labour when wages change. In other words, when wages rise, when wages fall, yes, that will affect the quantity demanded by firms of labour, but will it 
make a big change in how much labor they demand. And, you know, I've got two diagrams, two demand curves here, very elastic, very inelastic demand. Um, let's have a look at this. And look, this is very elastic, and that means that when, when wage rates uh, just change a little bit, W1 to W2, there's a very pronounced change in the quantity of labor being demanded. A small change in wage leads to a big change in firms' uh, willingness to, to change how much labor they demand. And, you know, that, that's the case when, when labor is very, uh, very easily substituted for capital. Um, so uh, a firm which has a, an easy choice about using machinery or workers may, you know, if the wage rises just a little bit, they may say, right, let's get rid of lots of workers. It's, it's much easier. We can bring in capital and use that now because it's so easy to substitute one for the other. That would be an example of, of when there would be very elastic demand. But the reverse is true here where even, let's say, let's take wage rate there, starting the W1, Q1. Look what happens when I increase and double the wage rate, it barely changes the quantity demanded. This would be the case where it's, the firm simply has no choice. They almost have to employ these workers. Even when their wage is doubled, they barely reduce the, the, the quantity needed. There's no substitutability with capital. Um, and perhaps also, you know, um, the, it could be a very capital intensive industry where even though the wage is doubled, wages as a whole represent a tiny amount of the total costs of the firm. So it, it may not actually affect the costs of the firm very much. An example might be oil rigs, where oil rig workers represent less than 1% of the total cost of running an oil rig. So if the oil rig workers doubled, then it wouldn't be true they don't want it to happen, but the firm would, would have to carry on employing virtually the same number of people, and it wouldn't represent that much of a change in their, in their uh, total costs, because the wages only are a small part of the total cost. It's mostly capital intensive. Okay, moving on. Um, moving on. Wage elasticity of supply. A measurement of the responsiveness of, of supply of labor when wages change. Elastic and inelastic. This is measuring in particular industries how much there is a change in how many people wish to work in an industry when wages change. In an elastic supply industry, when the wage changes, it makes a big reaction. So when the wages go from W1 to W2, there is a very large reaction in the amount of people willing to work in this industry. This would be typical in a low-skilled industry where it's very easy for people to enter the industry, make themselves available, they don't need a lot of training, they don't need particular qualifications, and they can switch. So it might be, um, you know, it might be a, a cleaning job, uh, or um, uh, or a basic office job, or, or you know, working uh, at harvest time in agricultural in the agricultural industries. Uh, it's quite easy to, to to make yourself available. But imagine this situation where even if wages went up a lot, and I'll show again, wages doubling. and yet it barely has any change in the quantity being made. Well, this might be brain surgeons or something like that, where you know, the, the pay goes up enormously, and yet not many people can make themselves available because it takes so much time to train, and most people would be able to do it anyway. And uh, so it's, it doesn't really affect the number of people making themselves available as brain surgeons. It might bring a few ex-brain surgeons out of early retirement, or something like that, um, or there might be a very, very few people who are qualified brain surgeons, but at the same time are also concert pianists or professional footballers or um, economics teachers, and they, they switch out of that other job back into brain surgery, attracted by the higher wage, but it really won't be many people at all, because it's, it's very inelastic supply. Okay, let's, let's move on again. Minimum wages. Now, I've got a separate video on minimum wages coming up later. But look, just to show you that if the government imposes a minimum wage, that can disrupt the market's ability to establish an equilibrium wage. Here, if the wage rate is set above, the minimum wage rate is set above the equilibrium wage rate, it, the, 
the equilibrium cannot be reached and it creates excess supply. You know, the lowest the wage can go is this minimum wage and that means that the quantity demanded is here, the quantity supplied is here, market forces want to take the wage rate to W1, the equilibrium, but the law says no, and that creates excess supply, more people wishing to work than there is demand for the workers, that's unemployment. Excess supply is unemployment in a labour in a labour market, and we look at that later when we look at market failure in labour markets. Okay, so um, so there we are. That's uh, an introduction to uh, labour markets. Very very similar in its operations and its mechanics to uh, regular ma markets for goods. It's just that um, you have to think of it in terms of the firms doing the demanding, and individuals, people doing the supplying. That's it. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye-bye.